but you know the many problems that we have. We are causing many problems since uh, the, our independence and also our education level is balanced. Really, we don't have any model standards as uh, other international countries. What I learned here, I may bring them back to Congo and to teach my fellows, stimulate students, to tell them that there is hope, nothing, nothing is lost. Around me, you can see the partially ruined city of Goma, destroyed some years ago by the volcano. Just behind me down that road, which covered half of downtown Goma in lava. And although I can see Rwanda there, this place could not be more different in every manner. There is no real rule of law here. I can honestly say that the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, just blows everything else away. It's nuts. Moments of incredible, dazzling beauty, all mixed together with horrible poverty, smashed up roads, lava fields, terrible dust and smog, corrupt officials, corrupt police, corrupt army. But on top of it all, a fantastic, joyous, joking nature of the Congolese people themselves. There is no control, governmental control. There is notional central power, but really here, along the eastern border of the Congo, it's run by warlords, by mercenaries, and by companies who want to gouge the mineral wealth out of the ground of the Congo. And the victims of all the strife that's been going on here for the last decades simply live on top of it, trying to scratch a living with some of the poorest people in Africa. And it's to this backdrop that I must consider my quest for scientific research. And somehow, it suddenly seems just a little bit trifling. Thankfully though, I met an American with a stronger stomach for science. One who had actually carried out research in the Congo. Like, I'm Cyril Benuna. <laughs> you can just, yeah. I'm Cyril Benuna. So, uh, I was sent to Congo uh, for my master's thesis, uh, where I worked on a monitoring system for attacks on schools by rebel groups. So, in many different parts of South Kivu, which is the province that I was based in, uh, there are different operational rebel groups, as well as the military uh, groups that are are, uh, allied with the, the government, uh, which don't always and often don't at all cohere with international laws. So they often use schools as uh, bases for weapons storage or a place to sleep or a place where they can get free labor. Uh, there are a lot of rapes, there are a lot of burnt schools, there are a lot of uh, raids. I would have to go into the, the bush uh, to interview school directors and teachers and village chiefs. Uh, all of this was often really, it felt impossible uh, because it was almost like being in the trial, lost in this bureaucracy uh, where you go to one person, they tell you to go to the other person, who tells you to go to yet another one, uh, some of whom don't even exist at all, uh, with forms that haven't existed since the 1980s uh, just to put things in your way, obstacles or uh, just kind of slaps to the face so that they don't actually have to do more work uh, on your behalf. A lot of it was just trying to get us to give them money. Huge and frustrating, the Congo seemed to defy all attempts at research. Even Gideon, a scientist from the Congo, was pessimistic. Okay, uh, when I go back, the first thing, if I say I go directly into research, I'll be maybe alone to do that. Oh, they say one finger cannot wash all the all the face. Sorry, say that again. One finger cannot wash all the face. As we say in French, un doigt ne peut pas laver toute la figure. So the better thing would be uh, to teach others. Science, it seemed to me, was a non-starter, a bridge too far for the wild Congo. But I was wrong. Find out why in the final episode of Science of the Wild.